It is good to be with you. I realize that the bio probably needs to be updated because I've now been with DCBC for three years and those years with MACBF have ended. Surely I could not do two positions with that, this level at the same time. But thank you for your warm welcome. I bring you greetings on behalf of our over 160 churches and organizations who are part of DCBC, spanning the DMV, going all the way to the coast of Maryland, as well as Florida and Georgia, and deeper into Virginia as well. DCBC is grateful for University Baptist Church and for your commitment and participation with us. In fact, your retired pastor John remains on our DCBC Foundation Board, and we're grateful for that. Your own Curtis Ramsey Lucas has presented during a book conversation roundtable with us, as well as your own Tom Rogerson, who has presented during a pastor's chat and during our annual gathering. So UBC, you have been well connected with us as a, also as a host for the annual gathering years ago. And I hope this year some of you will come at the end of October, the last Friday and Saturday, to our annual gathering for the minister's convocation, for the older adult convocation, for a wonderful time together. And we'll be talking more about DCBC after worship, but for now, would you please pray with me? Oh God, we know that there is power and there is hope in the name of the Lord. As our hearts sing and are stirred, as we are quiet and still, as we shout and as we scream, may we declare who you are in word and deed. And so in this time, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In times of change and transition, it is important and necessary and healthy to ask questions. Who am I? As a congregation, who are we? What is God calling us to do? And perhaps even, what is God calling us to put aside just for a little while? These questions are so important, and this is the time. When, when we engage in these days of transition, questions bubble. Questions even about who is this person standing in the pulpit? Last week, the passport camp report was encouraging. Wasn't it interesting to hear the various generations of passport attendees share their testimonies from eating peach ice cream to engaging with their youth group to having fun with their youth group, joining other churches of the DCBC, the mission experiences, the encounters with God, the transformation that is possible when we get away and take time to engage with each other and to see firsthand the work of God, which we might miss in the ordinariness of life. Sometimes in a regular old day, we might miss the beauty of the sunset, the power of a smile, a stranger's hello, let alone the miracles taking place within our own bodies and in our psyches, which are sometimes overlooked, expecting something grand. And in some churches, congregations are wondering where they'll be, what are they about, and the pandemic has helped to bring about lots of questions that probably should have been addressed a decade or so earlier. And you, University Baptist, are now in a great position, both in light of the pandemic and with the retirement of your beloved pastor of decades, to ask questions and to keep them coming. And yet even in the asking of questions, isn't it encouraging to hear words of young people, young people declaring the goodness of God 
even in the midst of asking questions. And not all questions have answers. Sometimes questions lead to more questions. Sometimes questions lead to dead ends or even hamster wheels. But other times, questions lead to deeper revelation beyond the expected, beyond the ordinary. And it's interesting that the disciples with Jesus, according to the Gospel of Matthew, find themselves in a location that Mark already so beautifully described. I sense you've been there. Oh, you haven't. Well, it sounded to me like you'd been there. I personally have not. But I know enough to know that Caesarea Philippi was the cross section, the crossroads of power and of commerce, of politics and trade, a powerful place an intriguing location for such a question from Jesus. While the Gospel of Mark describes this encounter that Jesus and the disciples were on their way, the Gospel of Matthew is very clear to name this location 25 to 35 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. And near this cave, as Mark described, this cave was dedicated to the Greek god Pan, and even from this waterfall, the Jordan River received more water. Herod's son Philip established Caesarea Philippi as the administrative center of government. Perhaps this isn't a whole lot different from the DMV the cross-section of power and politics and belief and no belief of commerce and trade. Perhaps this location isn't as obscure to us who live in these very cross-sections where these crossroads come and there's no escaping in many ways. In this place, According to the text today, Jesus dares to ask a question, perhaps inviting conversation, and this generic notion of, who do the people say I am? Well, if you're like me and other leaders, when someone comes to you and says, people, right there is a reason that I'd like to take a stop from the conversation for people to be defined. People can become rather nebulous. People can become a reason to dump, especially on a leader. So for Jesus to ask this question, he's not quite asking it in the same way perhaps you and I might engage the term people. He's sensing that there is expectation. He's sensing that perhaps the disciples could explain to him what they're hearing. And as we heard in the scripture read this morning, some thought maybe John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah and the general public, the crowd, they've experienced Jesus enough to know there's something different about him, to know he's no ordinary man. They've known this because they've experienced him. They've heard his words of wisdom and prophetic voice. They've seen his miracles take place. (laughs) Not unlike some other greats who have gone before, John the Baptist, Elijah, and so forth. But then Jesus asks his closest followers, who do you say I am? There's no way for them to sidestep this question and, and let someone else answer it, is there? They're standing in this location in in a way that they cannot now derail the conversation. You know, when you maybe were in school and a teacher asked a question and you decided to kind of take it in another direction. And for just a little while, the teacher went along with the conversation. Well, there was no opportunity for the disciples to take the conversation in another direction. Jesus was pointed and said, who do you say that I am? Not the people, not the crowd, but you. 
Now, this is not an exam sort of question. This isn't a get the right answer, fellas. This isn't a if you answer right, you get to stay in our group. But it's more of an allegiance question. Who do you say I am? To, to whom are you aligned? To whom do you offer allegiance? And we could have expected that Peter was the first to answer. If you recollect some other accounts in scripture, we'll find that Peter speaks first, he runs ahead of others, and he often is found responding first. That seems to be sort of Peter, right? There's also a sense from some scholars that Peter has taken on the role of spokesperson for the group speaking the mind and the heart of the unified voice of the Twelve. Perhaps he might have said, on behalf of all of us, let me tell you what we believe. But still there are other scholars who just say, this is Peter being Peter, jumping ahead, offering the answer. (laughs) In any case, The response from those who know Jesus the most intimately is quite different from the crowds. The crowds who only knew him from afar, observing his miraculous acts and his public words, the closest ones, the ones who walked with him for years, who probed and questioned him, who perhaps acted foolishly in his presence, who stood with him at the intersection of power and authority and the crossroads of trade and commerce. They were the ones, perhaps among others, but they were the ones who experienced a divine revelation beyond what was seen or heard or experienced. They knew that they knew that they knew that they knew that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the long-awaited one beyond human and yet human. And if you notice, Jesus calls himself the son of man. But Peter says, you are the son of the living God. This is the first time in the Gospel of Matthew where the title of Messiah or Christ is declared simultaneously beside the notion of being the son of the living God, declaring truly who Jesus is. Remember where they're standing, in a place that sat and gave honor to many gods. And yet here, Peter's declaration goes beyond naming a God yet to be established, a God yet to be revered by the cave and near the cave, but as the son of the living God. Scholar Mitzi J. Smith reflects this way, a living God is a dynamic God and not a static God whose clearest communication happened in the past. A living God is a dynamic God. Peter's declaration was not simply of his own volition, but because of his divine encounter and his fellow disciples' divine encounter, they had with God. They were having with God, and they would still have with God. In verse 17, Jesus said, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. A divine encounter they had in order for Peter to make such a declaration through God's supernatural engagement with the disciples in and through Jesus. Truth is declared and names are christened the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But even more importantly, their lives are transformed for the hope of the world. And did you notice that Jesus calls Peter 
the son of Jonah. Again, there's not a whole lot of consensus among the scholars of what this might mean. But there are those who believe that Jesus was understood to be the second Jonah, the one called by God to live out the call of God in faithfulness. And so if this is the notion that Jesus is reflecting, to be called the son of Jonah implies that God is directly involved in the blessing of Peter. The second Jonah was faithful. If Peter is the son of Jonah, he is a living, birthed presence to declare this news that Jesus is the son of God. Now, this is not central to the text, and I remind you it is not necessarily shared among all scholars. But I think it's worth considering for you at another time. After Jesus blesses this son, the famous declaration comes, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Listen to how the message in Eugene Peterson puts it. God bless you, Simon, son of Judah. You didn't get the answers out of books from teachers. My father in heaven, God himself, let you in on the secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And the world changes forever as the ecclesia, the gathering, the assembly, the church is named and grounded. New Testament scholar James Boyce puts it this way, discipleship is named founded and commissioned in this confession. Discipleship is named, founded, and commissioned. Again, the debates are plentiful. Is Peter the rock on which the church is built? Is the power of the intersection of the location the rock? Is the collective experience the rock? What does all this mean for the future of the church? (laughs) Again, there is plenty of conversation and many resources available for you to ask some more questions. There are some who declare ecclesia, the assembly, and Petra, rock, are both feminine words. While Petros, Peter, is is a masculine word, therefore this declaration, according to some scholars, is not about Peter, but is beyond him. So isn't it interesting or fun or maybe just confusing how scholars interpret and understand the scriptures sometimes so very differently from each other? But even in the midst of all of that, However we receive the declaration from Jesus and the blessing on Peter, this blessing has an impact on the growth and life of the church in powerful ways. Peter was executed by the Roman government. And his burial site has become, in Roman Catholic circles in particular, a holy landmark. If you get to go to Rome and to the Vatican City, you can be amidst that holy landmark. You can stand in St. Peter's Basilica. And whether you understand that to be the actual place of Peter's burial or not, you can understand the depths of the declaration of the blessing on Peter that has carried the church into the future that has gone from 12 disciples and other apostles to us today. And on that place is said to be 
the largest Roman Catholic church in the world. And isn't it interesting that we who declare Jesus can join with Peter? But we know it's not solely the words. It's not solely Peter's declaration, Peter's revelatory encounter with God is also for us. We need to heed the work of God in more than just and through more than just our words. No matter what we say or even what we do, there is no power greater than God and God's church will prevail as the passage declares, even the gates of Hades will not prevail. Last week when Curtis Ramsey Lucas shared how hope-filled he is for the future of the church as he chaperoned Passport Mission Camp, how hope-filled he was to see young people engaged to see young people delving into the presence of God through worship, study, mission, and fellowship on this rock the church is built and continues being built. For that we should give thanks. For the questions of Jesus and the declaration of Peter, we should give thanks. And University Baptist Church, who do you say Jesus is? How do you live out Jesus' identity in the midst of the questions? In the midst of the debates, the lack of trust in our communities, and the seeming inability in our society to unite, who do you say Jesus is? How do you carry Jesus from the crossroads of power and commerce, politics and trade into the quiet corners of your life? And how do you carry Jesus from those quiet corners of your life into the world? How is the the declaration of Jesus setting people free even through you? Even through this congregation in a facility that's awfully hard to find. What is bound here on earth and what is loosed? through your declarations. In this interim time, in this time of transition, you have been given the gift to ask questions. You've also been given the opportunity to reflect, to reflect on questions of Jesus, perhaps in a fresh and a new way. For the future of the church is God's and is an opportunity for us to walk in to that future, to ask away, ask and ask and ask, to reflect. Take it slow. There is no need to rush. For God is God and God will not change. And the Christ the Son of the living God will remain constant as the Holy Spirit walks with you on this journey of transition, of interim, of change. Brothers and sisters, continue to live out the call of naming Jesus. Naming Jesus in your words, in your deeds, and through lots more questions. Amen.